Broadcasting begin. Broadcasting is a development with which the future. When the Treaty of Versailles. When the Treaty of Versailles was signed in January 1920, the war to end wars was formally over. The gay 20s were about to begin. But the gaiety of the Charleston. Jazz, pogo sticks, talking pictures, and a new freedom for women as Dr. Mari Stopes opened her birth control clinics was dampened by the collapse of the post-war boom. Lloyd George's promise to ex-servicemen of a home fit for heroes was overtaken by poverty and mass unemployment. Even the election of a stable government under Baldwin couldn't divert a nation headed inexorably towards a general strike. The rich also suffered when the decade which began with a boom ended up bust. In 1929, the American stock market crashed, causing economic chaos throughout the Western world.
broadcasting is a development with which the future must reckon and reckon seriously. Here is an instrument of almost incalculable importance in the social and political life of the community, in affairs national and international. This is London calling. Now tonight our chairman, Lord Gainford, is going to speak to you on this, the occasion of the opening of our new studio at 2 Savoy Hill, London. As chairman of the British Broadcasting Company and on the occasion of the opening of our new London studio, I am glad to have the opportunity of saying a few words to our many thousands of listeners in throughout the country. The Broadcasting Company is not a monopoly. Last year, the manufacturers of wireless apparatus met together by invitation of the post office as it was realized that broadcasting would have to be controlled by one broadcasting authority if the chaos which today is so obvious in America were to be avoided here. I want you to understand that in addition to trying to protect our 600 manufacturing members, we have never lost sight of the interests of the general public. I hope that the present position may soon improve and brought to a satisfactory issue by the committee which the government have appointed. We are not going to stop broadcasting. Broadcasting has come to stay. Broadcasting has come to stay. This is this is two. Hello, Marconi House, London, calling. Two hello, Marconi House, London, calling. Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. This is two Emma talk. Rittle testing. This is two Emma talk. Rittle testing. All right now. Sorry, CQ. We had a slight technical hitch. GQ. Tonight we have a most marvelous thing that's going to happen. We are going to receive Rome. That famous Italian tenor, Gridlico, is going to sing Non Puto Ferrore Pantissimo, which being translated means, um, it's very difficult. CQ, the concert's ended. Sad wails the heterodyne. You must soon switch off your valves. I must soon switch off mine. Now we're going to receive it. There may be some atmospherics. There may be some, there may be some jamming. Pa, 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 pa. There may be some oscillation. Whew, but hang on, CQ. We're just going to receive it now. Hang on. is a development <laughs> making it illegal for anyone to keep in his possession milk churns which do not belong British Broadcasting Big <laughs> Well I'd like to be Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is A.J. Allen. I remember one night in 1923, 
I'd been to Savoy Hill uh, telling some story or other, and afterwards I was uh, sitting in what they called the drawing room, having a, dra um, uh, having a yarn uh, with the announcer. Uh, while we were talking, uh, the commissioner put his head in at the door and he said, um, I think you ought to know, Mr. Allen, that there's some people outside waiting to take your photograph. So uh, we peeked through the window curtains and there they were, four or five of them, and they got a blooming great camera on a tripod and flashlight apparatus and uh, goodness knows what. And I thought, oh, <coughs> I'd rather like to watch this. So I went out by uh, quite another door much higher up the street and wandered down and joined the group. And uh, after a bit, uh, I, I saw them take an excellent photograph of the announcer when he came out. And I know it was jolly good because when I autographed it a few days later, everyone said it was the image of him. Good night, everyone. Jack. Alas, they will never find us. Oh, Jack. Well? I'm so frightened. What, Dad? About the roof having fallen in. But it hasn't. It's only pretense. Well, yes, but when I pretend, it seems so real. Then don't pretend. Oh, but I want to pretend. I want to be frightened. Only hold my hand tight, won't you? Go on. We shall suffocate or starve, or, or both, my dear, in each other's arms. Oh, Jack. Even death shall not part us. Oh, Jack, don't. It's too awful. Our poor young lives cut so short. Oh, don't. Don't. There'll be articles in all the newspapers. Oh, I wish I could read them. You can't have your funeral and watch it, young lady. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> I wouldn't have missed it for anything. Won't I make Daddy's flesh creep? <laughs> oh. Good God, Mary. Oh, Jack! Oh. Oh, Jack! Quiet, you fool. Jack! Let go! You're throttling me. Let go of me. Let go. Oh, Jack. Step on the heebie, step on the jeebie, then we'll do the thing. The heebie-jeebie, grab your girlie, grab your boy. It just fills you full of joy. If you don't know it, come on, we'll show it. If it's something new, come on, we teach you. Step right up, let's take a chance. And do that heebie-jeebie, friends, come on and do it. Little Betty Bouncer is kind to her people and a nice girl, more or less. But at present, no joke, she's causing her folks no end of deep distress. For she is quite mad about a man she's never met. And it's all through an innocent crystal set. Little Miss Bouncer, a lobster announcer, a down at the BBC. She doesn't know his name, but how she rejoices when she hears that voice of voices. Absolutely tireless, sitting at the wireless. Oh, little Miss B. It's the man who announces with such a lot of passion in it. The Daventry shipping forecast will follow in a minute. Little, Little Miss Bouncer loves an announcer down, down at the, the BBC. The British Broadcasting Committee has arranged to transmit the following program each evening. 6 p.m. news bulletin. 8 to 9, music. 9 to 9.30, news. 9.30 to 10, music. This is London Calling. I have here a very important statement. Soon after midday today, the TUC asked the Prime Minister to receive them, and an interview took place at Downing Street between the Prime Minister and some of his colleagues and Mr. Pugh and other members of the TUC. Mr. Pugh informed the Prime Minister that the TUC had decided 
to terminate the general strike forthwith. To come here today with the Queen for the purpose of opening the British Empire exhibition. Our heartiest congratulations are due to the Board of Management, to the Executive Council, and to all who have worked with and under them for the marvelous organization and industry which have produced this triumphant result. The development of the radio play in the long run depends upon three things. Intelligent listening, informed criticism, and good writing for the microphone. Too many authors who've hawked plays round for years seem to say to themselves, oh well, it's no go. Let's bang it along to Savoy Hill. And they do. I wonder if they ever realize that a play written with a real eye to the medium of the microphone is so rare that its appearance is hailed almost with shouts of joy. I have just come from my church in Whitechapel, a great church situated in the midst of all the noise and the turmoil and the dust and the slums and all that Whitechapel connotes. And it is my privilege, by the aid of the wizardry of Mr. Marconi in this wonderful house, to speak, as I understand, to many thousands of people. Surely no man has ever proclaimed the gospel from such an extraordinary pulpit as I am now occupying. Having preached sometimes in cathedrals and sometimes in the kitchen of a lost house, I notice one great difference. Whether in the cathedral or the lost house, I could at any rate see my audience. Here I cannot. My dear friends of the Promenade Concerts, I cannot tell you how glad I am to be with you tonight, the last night of a remarkable season, which has seen this great hall fill to overflowing every night. It is a heartening thought to look forward to our meeting here for the first night next year, to join in singing with full hearts 
God save the king. This is London calling. Now, here is Miss V. Sackville West, who's going to describe to you a journey from Syria to Persia. Miss V. Sackville West. When I first told my friends that I was going to Persia, I discovered that to most of them, Persia was little more than a vague romantic name. They had very little idea of where it exactly was, and still less of how to get there. One of them said, quite frankly, that she knew it came somewhere between Constantinople and China, but she couldn't be more precise. May I say that this is the first broadcast running commentary on any support that has been given in this country. Don't forget your squared plan, the Radio Times, where to continue. The co commentator uh, to whom you've been listening was Captain H.B.T. Wakelam, and here is Captain Wakelam for the second half. Well, the first half has been about as, as, about as exciting as anyone could wish for. Oh, I can't go that. Look. They're off again. They're changing over. And it's Wales's kick this time. Pearl's taking it. He's kicking to the left. Wales defending the south end now. There he, there he goes, a long one. Sellers caught it. Oh. Lock, out to Gibbs. Gibbs is going you down the that? line. He's got past Andrews, and he's up to the 25. Oh, yeah. He's kicked across. The English packer up. The Turnbull's there. Oh, well done, sir. Good afternoon. <laughs> well, I'd like to be able to bring this bunch of records to you. And then I'd see from the look on your face whether each one pleased you or bored you. Songs, for instance, that we've heard so often, sung by our friends or by professional artists or played by bands or broadcast, do they still come to your mind with a fragrance of memory? With intense excitement, I went forward and unbolted the inner door. They slowly swung open, and there, filling the entire area within, stood an immense yellow quartzite sarcophagus. It effectually barred any further progress until we could raise the lid. Then a decisive moment. None of us but felt the solemnity of the occasion. In a dead silence, the huge lid, weighing over a ton and a quarter, was raised from its bed. Light shone into the sarcophagus. The contents were completely covered by linen shrouds. But as the last shroud was rolled back, a gasp of wonderment escaped our lips. So gorgeous was the sight that met our eyes. A golden effigy of the young king of magnificent workmanship filled the whole of the interior. This was but the lid of a series of three coffins nested one within the other, enclosing the mortal remains of the young King Tutank Ammon. In November, in November 1922, the British Broadcasting Company began regular transmissions. Although broadcasting time was heavily restricted and reception limited, 
A daily menu of programmes with their new radio stars quickly became part of everyday life. By the end of 1929, almost three million people had bought a ten-shilling receiving licence. The BBC and radio were here to stay. I look forward to greater achievement and to happier days. The 30s began with the misery of the Depression and ended in another world war. Hunger marches converged on London looking for sympathy and solutions. George V's Silver Jubilee momentarily lifted the spirits of the people, but King Edward's abdication divided their hearts. Fire engulfed the Crystal Palace, and also the celluloid railway yards of Atlanta in the cinema blockbuster Gone with the Wind. At a time of economic despair, dictators seemed attractive to many. Hitler promised the restoration of German pride and quickly rose to power. British party leaders, distracted by internal struggles, failed to notice the bite of fascism. Chamberlain's efforts couldn't deliver peace for our time, and quietly, on a Sunday morning in September 1939, the Second World War began. Hours ago, I discharged my last. Del problema. Von friendlichen Revisionen der Reihenfolge. This is the BB. This is. I think I kiss you now. When the BBC opened its television service from Alexandra Palace in November 1936, two rival systems of transmission, Baird and Marconi EMI, alternated weekly. There were 400 television sets in existence. By April 1937, two months after the Baird system was dropped, 1,500 television sets had been sold. We shall all have to wear them. Father will still go to work. Catching the 8.15, walking down the road, saying goodbye to mother. <laughs> and the flapper, she'll still flap as of yaw. Yes, and if she wants to give the glad eye, she'll do it with her windscreen wiper. BBC Television. This is the switchboard of Picture Page, a topical magazine introducing visitors, types, and personalities. You're through. You're looking at Type Major Massey, the bagpipes man from Trafalgar Square. Congratulations, happy days to you. You've sure gone down the hall. And we hope you have a lot of success. Congratulations, Mickey Mouse. You're wonderful, wonderful, Mouse. I think I'll keep you now.
no radio Olympia. This is direct television from the studios at the Alexander Palace. And now you're going to see and hear someone you know well, Miss Helen Mackay. The station goes on the air. A mighty maze of mystic magic rays is all about us in the blue. We're going to show you one of the visitors in our series of outside broadcasts, Golfers in Action. Our visitor on this occasion is C.A. Whitcomb, who, as most of you know, captained the English Ryder Cup team last year, 1936. He's going to demonstrate various shots, and he's going to start off with a drive. A beauty. Now, if there's anybody in this room who regrets leaving Savoy Hill and who had a melancholy feeling on the last day there, I suppose it should be me, as I was the first one to go into it, and actually it was I who found the place. But I have no regret at all. I have an affection for the place, but it was a scene of great labor and some achievement on the part of those of us who have moved in here. But I don't regret the past, because regretting the past is a great mistake. I look forward, and nothing but look forward, and I ask you all to look forward to, with me, to greater achievements and to happier days.
Well, Oliver, I suppose this will be about the last time we'll be pulling down that old iron gate of yours for me. Yes, sir. It really is the head of the oil. Well, so, here it goes. Good night, sir. Uh, good luck to all, sir. At the beginning of the 30s, the mix of radio programs was criticized in the Radio Times for being too highbrow. There were too many talks and too much serious music, not the stuff for the working man after a hard day. Listeners wanted more variety. It was in this atmosphere that some of the most memorable of the BBC's radio programs were created. Stand. Yes. And the most marvellous thing happened this morning. In my fan mail, I got a most wonderful letter. Now, you'll never believe it. It's absolutely unbelievable. It's a letter from a listener who is perfectly satisfied with the radio programme. Well, <laughs> really? Now, isn't that marvellous? I'd love his autograph. <laughs> <laughs> well, after all said and done, when you come to think of it, they ought to be satisfied, you know. Look what they get for ten shillings a year. You're quite right. All, all for ten shillings a year. year. Think of the things you can hear. Look what you get on any old set. All for ten shillings a year. Hearing how results are made. Learning how eggs are relayed. Hot chamber music is constantly laid. All for ten shillings a year. Bandwagon brazenly presents Chestnut Corner. <laughs> All the things we come out with. <laughs> My wife's the decided blonde. I know, I was with her when she decided. <laughs> How did you lose your hair? Worry. What did you worry about? Losing my hair. <laughs> How are you getting on in your new house? Oh, fine. I furnished one room by collecting coupons out of soap packets. That's a grand idea. Why not furnish all the other rooms in the same way? I can't. Why not? They're full of soap. Ich verkünde die Spiele von Berlin zur Feier der elften Olympiade neuer Zeitrechnung als eröffnet. That was Herr Hitler announcing it open. Now they're all cheering him, and they, the whole crowd have raised their right arms. These are sounds from the entrance hall in Broadcasting House. These uh, footsteps are the footsteps of people who are hurrying in to keep appointments in the building. And most of them make for the inquiry desks in each corner of the entrance hall. Two children have just passed me. I think they must be on their way to join the children's hour tour of Broadcasting House. I think we'll follow them to the reception desk where I can see that uh, several grown-ups are making inquiries. The two children who passed me a few moments ago seem to have uh, successfully run the gauntlet of the reception desks, although, as a matter of fact, I, I didn't hear them making any inquiries there. However, they've, uh, they've got away from the receptionists and have insinuated themselves into a party which I see waiting in the middle of the entrance hall. The whole of the centre parts come down, and the two points of interest is the South Tower, which is just on my right. I've got the wind coming over my head from the back, blowing away from London. And that, a little while ago, looked pretty hopeful, so they've got the power under control. There's a fire engine just below me here that they're getting up. They've been moving them all the while for the last few minutes, 
taking them to the north and the south so as to get going with the towers. The trouble with the south tower is that uh, another little fire seems to have broken out on some buildings just below it. But I rather think that there's a fair gap in between and it looks to me as though they'll probably get that under control and they'll save the South Tower. The South Tower is the one where the bad television works and we'd hoped originally to link our lines up there so as to be able to talk to from here. But as soon as we arrived, we saw there was no question of that. The King's life is moving peacefully towards its close. Signed, Frederick Willans, Stanley Hewitt, Dawson of Penn. I am speaking to you from the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. This is Windsor Castle, His Royal Highness Prince Edward. At, at long last, I am able to say a few words of my own. I have never wanted to withhold anything, but until now, it has not been constitutionally possible for me to speak. A few hours ago, I discharged my last duty as king and emperor. And now that I have been succeeded by my brother, the Duke of York, my first words must be to declare my allegiance to him. This I do with all my heart. It has been an ancient tradition of the British monarchy that the new sovereign should send a written message to his peoples. Science has made it possible for me to make that written message more personal and to speak to you all over the radio. This is the regional program, the illumination of the fleet. Once again, we're taking you on board HMS Nelson for a description of the scene at Spithead tonight by Lieutenant Commander Thomas Woodrow. At the present moment, the whole fleet is lit up. When I say lit up, I mean lit up by fairy lamps. We've forgotten the whole Royal Review. We've forgotten the Royal Review. The whole thing is lit up by fairy lamps. It's a fantastic. It isn't a fleet at all. It's just... It's fairyland. The whole fleet is in fairyland. Now, if you'll follow me through, if you don't mind, the next few moments, you'll, you'll find the fleet doing odd things. Now, at the present moment, the New York opposite me is lit out. And when I say a fleet is lit up in lamps, I mean she's outlined, the whole ship's outlined in little lamps. I'm sorry, I was telling some people to shut up talking. Through one of the marvels of modern science, I am enabled this Christmas day 
to speak to all my peoples throughout the empire. I take it as a good omen that wireless should have reached its present perfection at a time when the empire has been linked in closer union. For it offers us immense possibilities to make that union closer still. It may be that our future <coughs> will lay upon us more than one turn test. Our past will have taught us how to meet it unshaken. Goodbye, and here's to the next time. Sisters, hand in hand, posters of the sea and land, thus to go about, about, thrice to thine, thine. This is the National Program. Monday night at 7. The singing comer, Judy Shirley, accompanied by the orchestra, conducted by Charles Shadwell. It's Monday night at seven. Can't you hear the chimes? They're telling you to take an easy chair. To settle by the fireside, look at your radio times. Monday night at seven's on the air. Now here's a little lady, she'll imitate for you. Some personalities you've all adored. So let's ring up the curtain on Monday night at seven and start the evening well with better Lord. Everyone is agitated. The headquarters of the prefect are like a beehive, day and night and Sunday included. I've had to wait a total of nearly nine hours for two special permits. I've shown them all together exactly 47 times. I've been asked if I carry arms six times and searched for them twice. And once last night, someone mistook me for a refugee and tried to push me into a cattle truck. And perhaps that sounds vaguely amusing, but the whole refugee problem here is intensely serious and, and pathetic is the only word I can think of, unless perhaps tragic is better. There are thousands of them, mostly women and young children, coming over the three main entrances, Seber, Lepertus, and bourg -Madame. Some of them are in the last stages of exhaustion.
water power, mainspring of an industrial revolution, mainstay to an industrial north, cotton from the mills of Oldham, all the great trade of Lancashire, wool from the mills of Bradford, Yorkshire trade, and the steel foundries of Sheffield, power to spin and the power to weave, power to create in iron and steel a workshop for the entire world of men, power to create in iron and steel a way of life, death, and a new world, steel, the bone and muscle of a new age. The secretary went to the door and beckoned, and into the room stepped Peter Brass, carrying a bag of rattling tools, followed by Larry the Lamb with a pail of hot coals, which he placed on the carpet. Good morning, Your Worship. My, um, I seem to know your face. Brass, Brass. Ah, and now I have it. You used to be a pirate. What are you doing dressed up as a plumber? It's true, Your Worship. I was a pirate once before I knew any better. But I've reformed. I'm glad to hear it, Brass. I'm glad to hear it. And uh, what's that lamb doing here? Please, Mr. Mayor, sir, I, I'm the pirate's mate. I, I mean, the, the plumber's mate. I've decided to learn to be a plumber. My friend Toby is being a plumber, too. 